From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on September 11th, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome to our Quality Quorum for today. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 58th episode of Matters Microbial. Thank you so much for listening and or watching and for spreading the good microbial word. It really means a lot to me. The first week of my microbiology course has been quite lovely. As you can see here, I am a happy Doc Martin. And yes, that is a real and genuine smile. First, I tried to introduce students to the intersection of art and microbiology as with this microbial Warhol image I made. Me, I'm just glad some of my students knew Andy Warhol's work. After a few lectures, I had students create memes describing the things that they had learned in class. One student created this good or bad microbial choice meme. Another student loved the idea of organisms that lived with low, low levels of nutrients and created this totally awesome oligotrophy-themed meme. And a third student was impressed by the role that microbes have on global carbon and nitrogen cycle, calling them MVPs, or Most Valuable Prokaryotes. Sorry, Norm Pace. It's a fun way to learn and remember basic concepts, and I recommend it if you're teaching. In laboratory, I taught students about serial dilutions, as you can see. I also showed them how beautiful photobacterium could be in the darkness, as seen here. And getting ready for next week's serious LuxArt assignment, I encourage students just to create simple LuxArt with luminous bacteria, as seen here. And as I do every year, I enjoy demonstrating how the ice nucleation protein of Pseudomonas syringae can lead to the sudden formation of ice, seen here. Now, this protein is used to create snow in many resorts and is called Snowmax. I'll put a link in the show notes. As I've said before, it's important to me to introduce virology and virologists to this podcast. And one of my favorite types of viruses are the ones that interact with bacterial cells and are called bacteriophages. They have long fascinated myself and Dr. Jenny Quinn, as you can see with these musically inclined discophages. It turns out that bacteriophages are extremely important to many environments, assisting with nutrient turnover and other ecological issues. In addition, some bacteriophages can act as vectors of genes between bacteria, and some bacteriophages can hide within the genomes of their hosts. So, bacteriophages are fascinating, and they are everywhere. So it's an honor to introduce Dr. Cynthia Silviera of the University of Miami. She's going to tell us about her journey to the microbial sciences, her work studying bacteriophages in coral reefs and unusual environments, and even a course in virology that she teaches. Cynthia, welcome to the Quality Quorum today. Hi, Martin. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for the invitation. My pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm so glad. And, you know, as you know, you have bacteriophages on the wall behind you. I have them here. And let's face it, those are just the ones we can see with our eyes. <laughs> so I think, yes. a, I think a good place to start is to tell a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I am Brazilian, and I um, did my undergraduate degree in marine biology in Brazil. And since then, I started working on my, um, with microbial ecology in marine environments. And I, I just um, decided that that's what I wanted to do uh, for my life. So... I later on did a master's and a PhD that uh, took me to um, all sorts of places and environments. 
And it was really during my PhD that I encountered bacteriophages and I started working with them. And I fell in love. So during my, my postdoc, I decided that I, my research was going to focus on bacteriophage ecology. And um, I now study bacteriophages in several different environments. Uh, most of them are marine environments, but we also have collaborations and we work in different uh, places. And I hope we're gonna have a chance to talk a little bit my work related to astrobiology. Um, and yeah, so I, I came from Brazil and during my PhD, I, I was working in coral reefs and uh, my um, PhD supervisor, Fabiano Thompson in Brazil, he had strong collaborations with a group that was really a pioneer group in viromics in San Diego, at San Diego State University. So since the beginning of my PhD, I, I um, started learning from them. Some of them um, were visiting our lab in Brazil and I really decided that I needed to learn more. So I came uh, several times to San Diego during my PhD. And during that time, I uh, learned several um, viromics and viral ecology tools. And these is uh, these are the tools that form the basis of the research that I do nowadays here at the University of Miami. So it's important to say a couple of things. And one is, how did you like the food in San Diego? Because <laughs> I lived in San Diego for about ten years, and it was wonderful. I'm just saying. Yes, it's um, you get a lot of Mexican food there, and Mexican food. Um, is my favorite cuisine. Yeah. So uh, the food there is spectacular. It is. And it's such a lovely area. Although traffic's not good, you and I both know that. So let's stick with something that I'd like to have listeners and viewers really remember. Pretty much every living thing has viruses. And it's important to keep that in mind because we have a very focused mind for the new kind of microbial centrists, the new micronauts as they are. Um, they'll think of just particular types of viruses. Turns out that viruses have been around forever as long as there have been cells, pretty much. And so one of the things that I want to encourage people to remember is I don't believe that there is a single organism that we found that doesn't have viruses of some form, right? That's right. I think uh, there is uh, agreement that because viruses are, uh, replication machineries that are parasitic of uh, living cells. Um, whenever you have a replication system, you're going to have a parasite that evolves to take advantage of re that replicative system. So even when you had protocells, you likely already had protoviruses too. And these, the, the evolution of life is really a story of coevolution between cellular life and viruses. And that's something mm -hmm. that I take very um, centrally to my research and my teaching. It's this, um, this unity of viruses and cellular organisms as co-evolving entities. So just, just as something, again, for the, list, the listeners and viewers, and, and this isn't relevant necessarily to the presentation today, but when I taught a course in virology, one of the things that made students' heads explode was the reason that we are placental mammals is because of a virus that became part of us a long, long time ago. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I only say this because most people, just as they do with microbes in general, have a negative view. The other thing that I was going to say is that many people make fun of microbiologists because they say, oh, I'm not like a field biologist. I don't go to exciting places. And yet I believe you have photographs of yourself exploring coral reefs doing virology. <laughs> I do, although I prefer sharing the pictures of my graduate students doing there. So here's a yeah. picture of Natasha Verona. Uh, she's a PhD student in my lab and she's collecting samples from coral reefs in Curacao. And she is processing these samples to analyze viruses that are uh, double-stranded DNA viruses 
So here's also a picture under the um, electron microscope showing how these viruses look like. So uh, this virus here specifically was isolated by an, an undergraduate student that I worked with at San Diego State University a few years back. So this, this is the um, um, shape of this famous group, group of viruses, the tailed bacteriophages. And they are incredibly abundant. They are considered the most abundant biological entities in the planet. And this is the group of viruses that my lab is mostly interested in. And they, as they are extremely abundant, they are also extremely diverse and they are found in all different sorts of ecosystems. As I mentioned to you, I, I have been working on marine microbiology and specifically in coral reefs that have been studying what is the role of these viruses in coral reef health and coral reef uh, response to stress and coral reef response to anthropogenic impact. And what we have found over the years is that these viruses have a very important role in uh, controlling the abundance of bacteria. And that's the scenario that you observe when you have uh, what we call a pristine coral reef, a healthy coral reef with um, low levels of human impact. So in this other uh, figure that we have here um, showing the viruses and coral reefs, we see on one side of the figure uh, a reef that is dominated by corals, and that's usually also a reef that has a lot of fish, that has fish, high fish biomass. And, and these are also the reefs where you find high predation pressure of viruses over bacteria. So the viruses are controlling the abundance of bacteria. And this is important because if you have too many bacteria, bacteria are often really good, but if you have too many of them, they start competing for oxygen and competing for resources with corals, and that can be damaging to corals. So under anthropogenic impact, under climate change, what you might have is an overgrowth of this bacterial community, and that's damaging to the corals. And what our research has shown is that, unfortunately, when these um, bacterial overgrowth happens in coral reefs, the viruses start getting a little bit lazy, <laughs> so they don't kill the um, bacterial hosts as, um, as often as they do in a pristine and a low bacterial abundance reef. And instead, they can switch their replication strategies. And that is where comes in my favorite viral replication strategy that you can see in, these, in this figure. So in this um, figure here, we have the, um, the lytic cycle on one side where we have the, the red bacterial cells. And this is your classic replication cycle of bacteriophages, the, mo the most famous one, where the virus comes in the cell, it makes multiple copies of itself, and then it, it basically lies as it opens this bacterial cell to release the progeny. And many viruses have the ability to establish this other type of infection that we call lysogenic infection that you see in the blue cells. So in this case, these viruses come into the cell and instead of making many copies of themselves and, and killing the cell, they integrate into the genome of the cell. And that's really cool because now the virus and the bacteria are one entity. When the bacteria grows, the virus is replicated alongside the genome of the bacteria. And many times this virus is coming in genes that can change the bacterial metabolism, the bacterial physiology, the interaction of these bacteria with other bacterial members of the community, but also with eukaryotes, with animals, with algae in that environment. So in the coral reef, what I was mentioning before, typically degraded coral reefs where you have a very high abundance of bacteria, you have more of these lysogenic infections. And we have been trying to understand the drivers, what are mm -hmm. the factors, environmental clues that these viruses use to, to engage in these different types of infection. And importantly, what are the outcomes for, for corals, for algae, for the reef ecosystem as a whole when viruses make this switch. It's really interesting that you bring all these things up. Couple of things. There is a book from 
oh my goodness, I'm getting old quite a way, uh, quite a while ago about viruses and coral reefs. And I'll put a link to that. And in fact, uh, Dr. Rohrer is a co-author on that and someone who was a very good friend of mine who's passed away, Mary Yule. And I'll make sure that I put a, a, a link to that in the show notes. And one thing that I've really appreciated is seeing the two types of, of, of reefs, the one that have been overgrown by bacteria versus what you're calling pristine reefs. And that's very interesting. And this business of how a bacteriophage can kind of modulate or shape the communities that are there, it's really no different than when we're talking about the gut microbiome. And people talk about different effects, diseases, viruses, uh, environmental factors within our gut. Why would it be different for a large, complex holobiont that is a coral reef? And, and so I'm delighted to hear that. By the way, Dr. Rohrer used to say something that I was going to share with you. He would point out how many sharks there are per milliliter of seawater. You know where this is going. You've seen this. And then he would produce a small tube and say that there are many, many more violent predators. And he was talking about bacteriophages. And then I don't think he does this anymore. He held it up to his ear and said, I can hear them screaming. Now, I don't <laughs> think that he does that last part anymore, but it's an interesting way to look at it because we have a tendency to forget what the microbial perspective is. And that's important to keep in mind, I think. And so this is really exciting to see how things, we, we, we talk a lot about coral reef health. We've had other people on the podca podcast that have talked about the bacterial aspects of that specifically how there have been some outgrowths. There are some relatives of serratia that have caused some localized damage to reefs in Florida, yes. which you've no doubt seen. Yes. But you're looking at the viral impact on these things. Finally, this idea of lysogeny, these hitchhikers that hide in the genome. We have them in our genomes, as I've already mentioned. But even in like the lab rat that is E. coli, there are, I think, 12 defective prophages that are there, kind of like the rusting evolutionary hulk of the of the integrated bacteriophage. So this is a fascinating area, and I'm delighted you're looking at it. Yes, and the book that you mentioned, Coral Reefs in the Microbial Seas by Forrest Rower and Mary O, was really a foundational book for me. And I remember that when I read that book at the beginning of my PhD, um, the book really explored the role of bacteria in coral reef health. But at that point, the information about what viruses were doing in that context was very, very limited. And this is the progress that we have made through um, the work that I did and several other people in, in Forest Lab uh, to build this picture that we have now. And in fact, the this uh, diagram that I showed you with the bacteria, the viruses, the sharks, and the corals is from a paper that I published last year with several members of the Rower Lab in which we uh, summarized this, this knowledge that we've been able to build. And to get here, uh, one, a funny story is that I've spent a lot of time in Forest Lab in a dark room uh, doing epifluorescence microscopy to count viruses. So you have a picture here of this starry night. Uh, it looks like a starry night, but it's not. It is a sample of seawater that is stained with a molecule that makes DNA uh, fluoresce. And it's really cool because that makes us able to see the viral particles. So the viral particles in the, this picture are the um, the little dots, like the stairs in your in your dark sky, and the bacteria are the bigger planets in that uh, image. So, epifluorescence microscopy has been a very important um, technique for us, and I spent a lot of time counting viruses and bacteria in these uh, coral reef environments. We've traveled all across the the Pacific, collecting water samples and analyzing them under the microscope like this, and also uh, samples from, from Brazil, from where I'm from, and the Caribbean, and building this global picture of the current status of coral reefs in the context of their microbial and viral ecology. Oh, I, I think it is, and, and I, I 
of course seen the illustration that you you uh, uh, you you loaded up to show, but I've seen some of the uh, some of the the sky night of viral particles, and I wanted to tell listeners and viewers that on your website, which I will link to, and 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 I I know you didn't come up with the number, but you point out how many viruses are on our planet numerically, and it's a ten with how many zeros behind it. Thirty-one, <laughs> <laughs> and that I tells you. To, I don't even know how to say that number. <laughs> but it's but that's the whole point, and it's something that we don't even see, and most people aren't aware of. And it and and again, I keep coming back to this idea of of what I'm going to call microbial literacy. People automatically presume viruses bad, as they do with bacteria being bad, or always good for that matter. The fact is there are many, many viruses that are out there where we just don't know what they're doing. We don't know who the hosts are. We don't know how they interact with them. And that makes the work exciting, to my mind anyway. Yes. Uh, when we started sequencing viral genomes from environmental samples, over 90% of those sequences that we were getting, we had no idea what they were encoding for. So then the term viral dark matter came up as a term to describe this amount of unknown. And we are still there. We still have a very small fraction of the viral genomic information that we can assign a function to. And there are several uh, research groups trying to develop tools to improve that. And it is still striking and we still go to any ecosystem. You can get a sample from the pond on campus and most of that viral genomic information is encoding for functions that we, we don't know. And, and, you know, I have to say when I talk to students, and maybe you've had this experience as, as an educator yourself, so many students, they're tired, they're overcommitted, all these different things, and they want hard and fast rules. And I keep telling them there are things we don't know. And then I, I sense that my eyes are bugging out and I'm getting this big smile because when something's unknown, that's exciting to me. But when you're studying for an exam, you don't like that kind of thing, I suspect. <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, this is what I've often told people. I look at the night sky and it brings me joy at the depths and the complexity and the things that I don't understand. I feel the same way when I peer poorly, because my eyes are bad, through a microscope. And you can't even see viruses with a microscope, generally speaking. So how exciting. And that's something new every day. And this is what I tell people. Uh, scientists, at least, at least the ones who think like I do, it's the best job in the world, but it's not for everybody. We've talked a little bit about studying the communities between kind of the, the compromised reefs or the overgrowth reefs. And those are horrific photographs versus the pristine ones. Have you found any patterns with regard to the to viral colonization? Yeah, so in these um, more degraded coral reefs, we, as I mentioned, we find a lot of lysogenic viruses, those with the ability to integrate in the bacterial genomes. And one of the things that is very concerning is that a lot of these viruses carry virulence genes. So these are virulence genes, meaning that they are uh, making the bacterial host of these virus to become pathogenic to an eukaryotic host. So that bacteria can become pathogenic to uh, coral, for instance. Uh, this mechanism of pathogenicity is, is not really new. Uh, this is a mechanism that, for instance, Vibrio cholera Mm -hmm. uses, and even some strains of E. coli, some pathogenic strains of E. coli, uh, pathogenic strains of pseudomonas, they have their virulence genes encoded in prophages, which are these integrated viral genomes in the bacterial genomes. And we also find these virulence genes in coral reefs. So we have been developing methods in my lab to improve our ability to sequence viral genomes from corals. And we are comparing healthy corals and diseased corals, and specifically investigating the hypothesis that some coral diseases may actually be caused by this interaction between a bacteriophage and a bacteria, not just by a bacteria 
by itself or a virus mm -hmm. by itself, but this mutualistic interaction between the virus and the bacteria. So this is ongoing work that we have in my lab. And it's very important because a lot of core diseases, I think most of them, we don't know the pathogen. We don't know what causes that disease. And the coral reefs are suffering so much from um, human impacts, from climate change. So it's very important to identify the causes of these diseases so we can maybe do something about it. It's it's such a fascinating idea. And I know people, and I'm thinking of Stan Malloy, who you, you probably know from San Diego State, who once was able to show that you could just look out in, in open ocean water and find bacteria carrying particular toxin genes from things that cause disease in people. That doesn't mean that they developed out there. What that means is there's so much horizontal gene transfer. And the concept that you're talking about here with coral reefs is applicable, as you've alluded to, to human disease issues. For example, Clostridium botulinum actually has the botulism gene that makes the botulin toxin actually as part of a prophage. So you can find things that look just like Clostridium botulinum, but they're not infected by that virus and they don't cause botulism. But when they're lysogenized, that hitchhiker is carrying that extra gene. It's called gene conversion. What's fascinating to me is that everybody looked at these pairwise before, and now you're looking generally. And that, once again, reminds you there's this cloud of bacteria around us. There's this cloud of viruses around us. And now there's this cloud of genes all around us. Exactly. We are really interested in building networks of interactions between genes, viruses, bacteria, and eukaryotes. So it's a network with four different types of um, members, but it's very important if you want to understand the um, flexibility of microbiome. So a lot of the genomic flexibility of bacteria comes from genes that are laterally transferred by viruses, as you know very well, because I know that you have worked with transduction by bacteriophages before. So uh, we have been building these networks of interactions. And I also studied these interactions in cystic fibrosis a few years back during my postdoc. So most of my research has been in coral reefs. But as you mentioned, a lot of these interactions are relying on mechanisms that are very fundamental, regardless of the system that you're looking at. And sometimes the, the molecules that mediate interactions between bacteria and eukaryotes are the same or very similar, uh, regardless of we, if you're talking about an amoeba or a human. So I'm very interested in how these uh, mechanisms are translatable across very different systems. And so much so that now I'm studying a completely new system in my lab, which are um, anoxic lakes that have importance for geobiology and astrobiology. So I like to say that my research on bacteriophages has taken me from coral reefs, through the human lungs, all the way to outer space. <laughs> That is just so wonderful. And I've been looking forward to this. Is it time to move on to the astrobiological aspects of this? Because I love the fact that we're not falling into looking at simple model systems. Now we're going to look at low oxygen levels in lakes, what are called anoxic lakes, where most people say, hey, that smells bad. I don't want to mess with it. But you and I, we see research opportunities there. Exactly. These lakes are certainly stinky. Um, so these lakes that we are studying are called meromitic lakes. And at the top, at the top layers, they are just like any other lake. They have oxygen, they have a mixed layer, they have fish, they're beautiful lakes. And their bottom is completely anoxic. So these lakes are permanently stratified. And that creates an environment that is very unique, very special where you have um, this anoxic lake reaching the, uh, uh, the sunlit layers of the water column. And right at that portion where the water is anoxic, but it's high enough that it's well lit, then you have the growth of this group of bacteria that are uh, green and purple sulfur bacteria. So these are bacteria that make photosynthesis. So just like plants, they are able to capture CO2 and then fix that into organic carbon. 
but different from, from plants and from cyanobacteria, they do not produce oxygen in doing so. So they uh, utilize sulfide, so they are sulfide oxidizers. And what is interesting about these phototrophic bacteria is that they were very important primary producers for the whole planet in several periods of the history of Earth's evolution. So uh, our planet has not always been full of oxygen. In the beginning, we were actually a pretty anoxic planet. And then the rise of cyanobacteria led to the accumulation of oxygen in the oceans at the beginning, only at the surface. So when you look at this uh, structure of past oceans, it's actually very similar to these anoxic lakes that I study, where you have an oxygenated top layer and then an anoxic bottom layer that is rich in sulfide. And that's why we call these lakes uh, modern analogs for past Earth oceans. And for geologists to make interpretations of the geologic record that is uh, that comes from those periods in the history of the planet, we need to study the geochemistry of these lakes nowadays. Um, so a few years ago, I got introduced to this system by uh, collaborating a good friend of mine. Her name is Alice Bosco. And we were classmates as undergrads. She went on to study geology and I went on to study microbiology. Uh, but we met just a few years back and she was explaining to me these interesting questions about the evolution of the planet and the co-evolution between life and the planet that she was studying in these lakes. And the, the issue there that she presented to me was that some of the biosignatures that geologists look for in the geologic record, biosignatures left by this phototrophic bacteria, they are decoupled. So let's say that the carbon and the sulfur biosignatures cannot be easily interpreted. Um, they don't align with each other. And I suggested to her that it could be maybe because of viral infection. And, and she was very curious and she asked me, how so? So I explained to her that when a virus infects a cell, it can change the bacterial metabolism completely. It can change the physiology, just as we were talking about bacteria become pathogenic to humans because of a viral infection. A bacterium can also change their metabolism dramatically during viral infection. And uh, she took me very seriously and we started working on this. So we, uh, um, we got samples from some of these meromitic lakes that we are now studying. We, um, we have a project funded by NASA to study these lakes because the study of the co-evolution between life and the planet is essential for our search of life in other planets. And our, because our study has this implication for, for biosignatures, how uh, living cells leave signatures in the geologic record that you can interpret later on, this may be applicable in the future for the search of life in other planets. So we are studying uh, these lakes that have really pink water. So here's a picture of one of the lakes that we are studying. This lake water uh, inside the bag looks extremely pink. It's uh, Barbie pink, we call it. And it's, this is just how it comes out. So we, this is a, a water sample that we are pumping from about seven meters depth. And the amount of purple sulfur bacteria is so tremendous that the water becomes completely pink. Uh, so it's very striking. And we, um, we are studying other lakes that have not only the, the pink bacteria, but also some of the green ones. And we found evidence for um, the infection of these bacteria by viruses that encode genes for uh, for the synthesis, for carbon fixation, for sulfur metabolism, for pigment productions, meaning all the metabolisms involved in biosignatures. So they're, they're exchanging DNA. By the way, when you're looking in these meromictic lakes, 
Lynn Margulis and her and co-workers many, many years ago used to find predatory bacteria in the Meromictic Lakes. I think that has to do with the high population density of things like chlorobium, but keep an eye out and, and, and let me know if you see them. Yes, we certainly see chlorobium. Uh, one of the lakes that we study is um, a chlorobium lake. <laughs> we, so chlorobium has very high abundance in that lake. And um, one of the questions that we have there is, what determines the abundance or the dominance of one group of phototrophs versus another? So you have the green ones, you have the purple ones. And the reason this is important for the perspective of geobiology and astrobiology is because these two different bacterial groups, they have um, different biosignatures, so they, they leave different signatures in the geologic record. And they have different requirements for light and sulfide and different sensitivities to oxygen. So when you detect their biosignatures in the geologic record, you can make several interpretations about what the environment looked like when those bacteria were alive. So you can use that coupled with uh, dating of those samples and several other geochemical parameters. You can reconstruct what the oceans looked like at that moment in time when those bacteria were present. So it's very important that we are able to make um, interpretations about these different biosignatures. And the viral uh, manipulation of bacterial metabolism is now emerging as a potentially driving factor for the, uh, the different carbon and sulfur as a topic signatures in these lakes. Oh, that is so fascinating. And you have NASA money to study it. That's just fabulous. <laughs> Yeah, it's very interesting because um, NASA is so famous in, in, in pop culture, right? Like people use NASA t-shirts and, and hats. And uh, when we do basic research, we get uh, funding from federal agencies like the NIH and the NSF. And those, those um, agencies are just not as famous, but they support our research and they are as fundamental as any other uh, source of funding for research. But then once, as soon as you get funding from NASA, then everybody can easily relate to it because they are so familiar. It's such a big part of our culture, of our popular culture. So you tell friends and family that you got funding from NASA and, and uh, people get super excited and they want to know if you're going to go to space, if you're going to go collect samples in Mars. I wish, <laughs> but uh, not, not yet. For now, only pink water lakes. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because I'll run into people that will hear about NASA funding life in extreme environment research, I should say, uh, into life in, in, in unusual environments. And sometimes they'll want me to justify that, which is not a hard call for me. I'm happy to to justify that because by understanding those kinds of unusual organisms, they'll often give insights into how life first is able to get a foothold here or how life may change as the planet itself changes. And so these are all important questions to get into. And what I like about what you're describing is how you're using your research as a lens to look at, at how life was on this planet before and maybe how it might be elsewhere. And I think that's really valuable. Also, you're showing the same thing that you discussed with regard to coral reefs. There's this interplay via horizontal gene transfer. And this is fascinating to me because some people believe, and Carl Woese was one of them, that early life exchanged much more information than we're used to today. So it, you know, it wasn't like genus and species as we talk about. There was so much gene exchange. And maybe this is an echo of that as well. Exactly. A big part of this, this research that we are doing in the lakes involves getting those genes that we find in the viruses and comparing with the bacterial versions of the same genes and then doing that for several viruses, several bacteria, building phylogenetic trees. And uh, it's very interesting because we see 
that these, these viruses have a very important role in the diversification of these genes. So it mm -hmm. is likely that they are vectors, they, they are um, moving these genes around in the community, but because of their replication rates and their mutation rates, they might also be trying new versions of the genes that maybe have higher, um, if it's an enzyme that, that gene encodes that maybe has higher catalytic rate or maybe has an expanded um, range of substrates that it can act on. So there's this diversification of the functional repertoire of the community, of the whole microbial community that is mediated by these viruses. And evolution likely took advantage of this through now the diversification of cellular life, right? It took advantage of the fact that the viruses can be moving these genes around and um, probably speeding up adaptation processes to environmental change. Oh, I believe me, this echoes back to some of my earliest interests in science. So I'm adoring seeing it. And you know, it's interesting because I think um, older individuals, or as I prefer to call myself, and tropically challenged individuals, uh, will like a model system that's well studied and asking yes or no binary type questions. But that's not how life is. And when I first started in this business, you know, you would, because I'm trained as a microbial geneticist, you would make a mutation in an organism, and then you would see if there's a change in a phenotype. But nowadays, what I can do is I can look at an organism that's adapting to environment, and I can compare the whole genome to the original version of it and find out specifically among all of the genes that were present in the organism, which of them have changed. And it certainly is something that's now filtering through to undergraduate uh, research institutions like my own. And, and so it's such a wonderful time to be a microbial scientist, isn't it? It is amazing. And um, you mentioned the, uh, the undergraduate experience and how undergraduates learn. And I um, take advantage of this diversity of viral genomes and lateral gene transfer and all the different types of interactions that viruses have with cells in a course that I teach called Biology of Viruses. So this is a, a course that I do not call virology because uh, on, um, that's on purpose because I often hear that the students associate virology with courses that have a medical perspective of viruses. So mm -hmm. they have a very strong component of understanding the immune system and how the human immune system interacts with viruses. And those are extremely important, but our course comes in and fills a different gap, which is the one um, where we are looking at viruses as biological entities and as fundamental biological entities for the evolution and the functioning of cellular life. So we uh, study viral genomes and we look at uh, their evolutionary processes, their molecular biology, their ecology, and we also study their medical importance. We are very interested in epidemics, of course, since the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But we, we developed this course um, to really take advantage of genomic tools. So what I do is, uh, I, in the first day of class, I distribute a text file to uh, the students in the class, so each student gets a different text file, and that text file has the genomic sequence of a virus, but that's not identified, so the student doesn't know what is that viral genome. And so the course is a project-based course that we develop uh, by showing the students the different bioinformatics tools that you can use to analyze viral genomes. So every week, mm -hmm. students learn a different tool, so they discover what their virus is, what genes it encodes. And every week we also discuss publications about different aspects of viral evolution, molecular biology, and ecology. And in the process, the students start um, merging their personal interests with aspects of the biology of the virus they are looking at. And so they develop a research project 
where they pick a question that is of their own interest and they use their those genomic tools to answer that question. So it's really cool because the students have a lot of freedom. They are surprised and scared at the beginning because they're not used to courses that give them that much freedom. Uh, even laboratory courses sometimes will have um, um, a, a series of, of questions or experiments that you have to perform, but in this case, they really set the question and set the methods that they're gonna use. And so some students that study marine biology, for instance, they will be uh, interested in how viral infection of bacteria impacts the oceanic carbon cycle and, and climate, how that relates to climate change. Uh, students that are pre-meds will maybe mm -hmm. more interested in the uh, viral epidemics and um, maybe development of vaccines, biotechnology, viral vectors. And, and we have students from majors that are not necessarily biology or, mm -hmm. or bioscience. And those students uh, find topics like vaccine hesitancy or how the socioeconomic variables of a society will impact the um, dynamics of an epidemic and, and viral um, infection. So in this course, we don't only study bacteriophages, we study all types of viruses. Mm -hmm. And I, I am really uh, surprised with the, the different stories that I hear. The discussions every week are so lively and the students come up with projects that are extremely creative. I've been learning a lot from them. So this course is actually a course for myself mm -hmm. where I learn a lot from the students' projects as they, they develop it. You know, I cannot emphasize what an important strategy you're using because ownership always works. Are there going to be people who don't care and they're not going to put in time? No. But if you allow a student to pick their own interest and investigate that, they feel more motivated to do it. And they want to share it with other students. And then the other students want to share with the first student. And it creates a wonderful situation. Now, I don't know how large your class is. Probably if the classes became too large, that would be hard to do. But I've used things similar to this for years with my introductory writing courses. Um, I, I had a, my version of virology, which is pretty close to what you describe here. Were there things that could have gone differently? Of course. But the point was each of those students walked away with some things that they came up with, that they thought of, that they found interesting, that they wanted to share with others. Exactly. And the, the evolution of the students over the course of the semester is also incredible. I can see how in the beginning they don't feel as comfortable with this level mm -hmm. of freedom and uh, also the constant feedback that we have in the course. So they are constantly um, leading the presentation of scientific papers and um, performing this bioinformatic analysis. And, and they get constant feedback from me and from the other members of, mm -hmm. the, of the class. And after a few weeks, you can tell how much they appreciate, how much they are engaged and how much growth they grow through over the semester. A lot of these students are uh, that take my course are um, senior students. They are closer to to graduating, and that moment they are making uh, decisions about their career, about what's their next step. And I've been really happy to see how they uh, they use this course as also a moment to to discuss career, to discuss possibilities for their future. And they come talk to me and, and involve me in those discussions. So it's it's really rewarding. It is a small course, though, as you said. I, I wouldn't be able to do this in a really big course unless it had a lot of uh, teaching assistants and, and help for that. But these are uh, small courses. I also teach large courses. And yes, those are um, harder to implement project-based learning. But I am thankful that I have this opportunity with biology of viruses. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful idea. Your students are very lucky. I am. I am lucky to have them. <laughs> you know, and this is a really good example. Uh, I've always said that I learn 
as much, if not more, from my students than they learn from me. And that's because once they're comfortable with communicating, they feel supported. You're not going to make a buzzer sound if they say something that isn't correct, which I've seen, but never done. <laughs> um, they'll ask a question and they're, they're normally afraid to ask it, but it's an excellent question. And once they see it's all right to ask questions, sometimes you see things from a different perspective. And that's really how science advances. I've had some really sharp students develop that way. So it sounds like we're on the same page. Yes. Now, Cynthia, we're, we're almost out of time. So what I, I thought I'd do at this point is ask, what was the one thing that really made you a microbial scientist? Do you have one experience, just boom, you were convinced? Um, yes. <laughs> I took a um, virology course in the university when I was still a high school student. So my high school had connections with the federal university in Rio de Janeiro where we... Um, we were exposed to research at that point, and those were very unique and special opportunities. And at that point, I had enough background to understand what different nucleic acids were. I had enough background to understand cells. And when I was presented with that level of diversity, complexity, mm -hmm. and importance of viruses, I I completely fell in love. I I was... Um, really involved and, and decided that I wanted to do microbiology. I didn't go back to work on viruses until much later in my PhD, but that experience, it was an, a course offered by the microbiology department of the, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And, and that was uh, very special for me. We were able to walk into the research labs and that was phenomenal. And all that I saw in that course was really impactful for me. It sounds wonderful. It has been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. And, and I really want to wish you and your family and colleagues and friends the very, very best of, of, of everything. And I hope you don't mind if I send you a couple of questions afterwards. Yes, of course. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'll be happy to answer any questions later. You, it's been wonderful. Thank you again. You're very welcome, Mark. This has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode with tasty links can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Cynthia Silviero is in the Department of Biology at Miami University in sunny Florida. Many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and Reber Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope that you've all enjoyed being part of our quality quorum today. See you next time on Matters Microbial.